recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 128 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, I'm with it. I'm hip. Because we're going to talk about hip biomechanics. Yes, folks, how does your hip move when you squat? How, what happens with FAI? Lots of other wild and crazy things. It's going to be hips don't lie, Shakira-style debrief. Because your boy Big Z has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here. Fam recognize fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Raj, my man Raj. Here's what Raj asks. In human matrix, a lack of internal rotation suggests concentric activity of the external rotators, a secondary compensation, if I'm not mistaken. This is in the upper body, by the way. This activity is brought about by your arms returning to an orientation that makes them more useful. So what he's saying is if my scaps are internally rotated, so I got like the hunchy position, I'm going to externally rotate my arms so they are facing forward. However, in, in a hip rotation debrief you did, I'll link it in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash hip dash biomechanics. But in a hip rotation debrief you did, it seems that this mechanism is a bit different. What I came away with is that limitations in internal or external rotation of the hips are, bought about, are brought about by orientation via inhaled or exhaled spines. It seems that the rotation in the first scenario is limited by compensation, the first scenario being uh, the scapula, and the second, the hips, in orientation. Am I getting that right? It seems like the relative mobility of the joints in question might influence that, but what's going on here? Is there an underlying heuristic that can help me figure out when something might be due to muscle tone or when something is due to bony position? When I teach scapular mechanics in human matrix, if you have scapular external rotation, that leads to a concomitant internal rotation at the humerus. Thus, you are going to be limited in external rotation. And this makes sense because if I look at the rotator cuff muscles, if I internally rotate the humerus, that's going to concentrically bias the subscapularis. Well, what about if the humerus is fixed and I move the scapula? The medial border of the scapula is going to compress against the thorax, which is subscapularis's proximal action. We run into an issue now, right? Because I don't talk about that necessarily in the pelvis. For example, if I nutate the sacrum and the nominates posteriorly rotate, which involves internal rotation, the, the femur is going to fall into internal rotation. Thus, I would have an ER limitation. To mirror that in the scapula, though, what I talk about is, well, if the scapula IRs, this would be an ER at the humerus. Thus, you'd have an internal rotation limitation. So it seems like we got two things mixed up here. What the heck is going on? Well, I think there's two things at play here. First off, when I talk about the scapula internally rotating and the humerus externally rotating, this is a compensation. If this was an orientation issue and I internally rotate the scapula, humerus would actually follow suit. So if I fell forward, it would be like my arm's going to be orienting inward. So that's a one layer of compensation. Right? But I can't really use my arm in this position. So the next layer of compensation would be me to externally rotate the humerus. So you got to step one, step two. So that's one piece. What that would look like here at the pelvis is if I nutate the sacrum and the anominates posteriorly rotate, which would be IR at the anominate, the femur falls into IR. And then the loss of range of motion would be at external rotation. That's an orientation. Now consider this. If I increased posterior compression for whatever reason, the way I would do that is by externally rotating the femur. So this changes. This would be a compensation at the femur. Maybe Think of it this way. It's like I fall into IR. Uh, 
but that's not enough to keep me upright or I still have to move into a position that drives external rotation, what do I do? I drive external rotation at the femur. So orientation would be what direction do the femurs fall because of the pelvis. The compensation would be what do the femurs do in response to that orientation. So that's one contention point. It's just generally when we're looking at uppers, it seems more often than not that there's a compensation occurring at the humerus, and that's why I teach it that way. The other thing to consider is I think there's a difference between internal and external rotation at the scapula versus what we see at the pelvis. So when I nutate and counter nutate, it's not this pure ER IR action. You actually have like a downward and upward rotation. So perhaps the analogous movement actually at the scapula, when we're talking about ER IR, if we're talking about orientation of the scapula and the thorax, would probably be more likely upward and downward rotation. That's likely a better surrogate to what's going on at the anominates. So that's another thing to consider in regards to this. So then, well, how do I know what the heck I'm doing and looking at? And Raj asked for a useful heuristic. And I don't know how accurate this is, but I found it very useful for me. And that's generally when I look at a measure of any kind, it's likely giving me an appreciation for what's occurring more proximally. So, for example, if I look at humeral measures, I use that as a proxy measure to tell me what's going on at the ventral cavity. How about this? If I look at elbow measures, that's going to give me a proxy measure for what orientation the humerus is in. So, for example, if, how do I want to know if I have a compensation at the humerus or not? So let's say that I am limited in internal rotation. You would think that that means I have an externally rotated humerus. Maybe, maybe not. If I'm externally rotated at the humerus, I'm going to have a harder time doing external rotation at the forearm, right? Because this is essentially your knee. Like when I straighten my knee, that would be tibial external rotation and femoral internal rotation. So then if I'm externally rotated at the humerus, I won't be able to internally rotate at the humerus, which what's the ER equivalent at the arm? Supination. So you might see a loss in supination. That would be your tell to let you know that you are indeed externally rotated at the humerus. How do I apply that principle to the lower extremity? Well, I'm glad you asked. So to apply that to the lower extremity, let's use the same example. Let's say I'm definitely externally rotated at the femur. What would that look like at the knee? Well, if I'm ER'd at the femur, that means I can't IR at the femur. So if I can't IR at the femur, that may mean down in the lower extremity, I'm going to have a harder time accomplishing the screw home mechanism at the knee. So you may actually feel a restriction in knee extension and external rotation. And that's how you can confirm the femoral position. And that's generally the way I go about it. So if you, if you are unsure about what you're looking at, use a distal measure to confirm what you're seeing proximally. If I can't ER my uh, femur, that means that I'm likely anteriorly oriented and problems are ensuing. If I can't IR my femur, that means I have posterior compression. And that's how I would look at it. Same thing with the scapula. If I can't IR my humerus, I know I'm compressed or concentrically biased anteriorly. If I can't ER my humerus, I know that I am limited posteriorly. And that's how I would approach this problem. Great question, Raj. The next question comes from Doman. And here's what Doman asks. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about femoroacetabular impingement, FAI. What would increase its potential? How would it be seen in measuring? And what kind of interventions could we pick? Awesome question, Doman. So FAI, basically, 
what that is is there's bony adaptations either at the femur or the acetabulum that could potentially be restricting motion. You have well, three lesions technically. A cam lesion would be a change in bony um, bone shape at the femoral head. A pincer lesion would be bone change at the acetabulum. And then a mix would be changes in both. And these changes could be a structural block that could limit your range of motion. That's the big thing with impingement. And generally what you'll find is you'll go into an end range, a lot of times hip flexion is very common, and you might hit a restriction and it could lead to a pinch in the area that you're trying to go. That might be an indicator of femoral acetabular impingement. Now, the thing with FAI, which is what it's called for short, is that you can't change the bony structure as a clinician or a coach. The only thing that we can change is the amount of movement options that are physiologically available. So I could have bony restrictions being a limiter to my range of motion deficits. I could also, though, have um, neuromuscular contributions that could be limiters of range of motion as well. And your job is to differentiate which of those you're dealing with. How would you go about fixing that? You would do the same things that you would normally do with some type of movement restriction. So what that might entail is if you have someone who's limited in hip flexion, well, you have one of two things to focus on. Maybe it's flexion and IR. If they're limited in flexion, you might need to do things that counter nutate the sacrum. So this could be something like drunken turtle or something like a hook line tilt. Anything like that that's gonna drive more counter nutation of the sacrum. There was a cool study done that I'll link in the show notes where they looked at how changing pelvic positioning can influence femoral measures. And when they created or when they drove an anterior pelvic tilt in femoral acetabular impingement patients, that actually led to a loss of internal rotation. So if you can't stack, don't talk to Zach about your FAI because maybe if I can create a posterior tilt, that can restore hip internal rotation limitations. The process does not change. You would still do the moves that you normally would do. But here's the issue. Let's say you do a bunch of stuff and you don't get any changes in motion. Then what you likely have to do is refer out to see if you can either get some imaging to see if there's something that can be done about it. In the last, I don't know, it seems like I had a, an epidemic of these, but in the last uh, couple months, I've had a couple cases like this where we did a bunch of stuff and the, the, both gentlemen who had like 90 degrees of hip flexion and they were young. So it's like, eh, this seems a little wonky. So I tried to do everything I could. And the funny thing was, well, it wasn't very funny, but we got great changes on the other leg, but the side that was affected didn't budge. And so I recommended that they go get imaging just to see what could be done. And maybe in that case, they could have some structural issues at play that need a surgical procedure to change. Um, because sometimes we, unfortunately, the structure is going to influence what the heck is happening from a mobility perspective. And you have to do things to address those limitations. And I mean, it, it sucks. It's not fun because you, you might have to undergo a surgical procedure. But it could be life-changing in the sense that you might be able to get your body into positions that you not, might not normally would have. Sometimes, especially if you're someone who's maybe had FAI for a while and that's changed to osteoarthritis, sometimes you might need to get a total hip. And it, it stinks that you have to go through that procedure, but I've known a lot of people who have had total hips that has been incredibly life-changing. So it's important that you go ahead and get that checked out. To summarize your great question, Doman, femoral acetabular impingement, bony changes to either the acetabulum, the femur, or both, you would not change a thing. You still go after improving the movement capabilities that one should possess. However, if you do stuff and you, they're stacking, they're able to shift, they're able to re reproduce everything that you want them to reproduce, and they still can't elicit a change, you might need to refer out to someone to get imaging to see what the next step would be. Now, I don't know what the surgical procedures entail or the success rate. I know if it's like a labral pathology, it seems to be hit or miss, but it seems like that's probably the best course of action.
Great question. The next question comes from Will. And here's what Will asks. You noted an inhalation external rotation strategy for a descent in a squat. Isn't there relative internal rotation at the true hip joint as we get further down into a squat? Thus, a lack of hip IR and scour associated with labral and true hip joint issues. So someone might have a loss of IR and they can't squat. Or is the external rotation strategy just what the muscles are attempting to do for a better flow of the hip, even though bony structures are going through an internal rotation motion? Thank you. Great question. So you are absolutely right, Will. There is an internal rotation action happening in the squat, but it all depends on at what point in the position we're talking about the squat. So let me, I grabbed my grandson before, let me get my son to help us out. Now, you might be wondering, what's the difference between my son and my grandson? Well, my son's a little taller than my grandson. So, with the squat, generally, what should happen is the sacrum should be counter-nutated and it should maximally counter-nutate as you descend all the way into the bottom of a squat. Why is that? The reason why is because if I counter-nutate, the posterior pelvic floor is going to be concentrically biased. That's going to limit me pushing my hips back. The front side of the pelvic floor is going to be eccentrically biased. That's going to allow me to maybe not necessarily move forward because there's only so much motion available into counter-nutation, but it's going to allow that more vertical displacement to occur in a squat, which is what we desire. Now, if you're if you're doing a sport like powerlifting or you want to do a squat that's more or closer to a hinge, that's totally fine. I'm just from a definition standpoint because it seems like people get a little amped up when we're talking about squats. Anyway, so then what happens as I go through the squat? The line of pull of the muscles in your pelvis change as you go from zero degrees of hip flexion to 130, 140. So from 0 to 60, the sacrum counter-nutates and by progressively counter-nutates more because there's more external rotation happening at the femur. The reason why this is has to do with the line of pull of the posterior rotators of the hip. If you want to learn more, there's a great article by Newman that talks about the, how the line of pull changes of the posterior rotators. So there's that piece. And these numbers are going to be person dependent. But as I now go from, we'll say, 60 to 90 or 100 degrees, or perhaps the sticking point, what you see is the femurs now start to begin to internally rotate. And what that internal rotation action does is it opens up the pelvic outlet, or it widens the infracubic angle, the IPA. When that happens, you have less counternutation. What starts to happen is the pelvis begins nutating. That doesn't mean that it falls straight into nutation, but it oscillates back towards nutation. So you do have some internal rotation at that point. Once you eclipse 100 degrees of hip flexion and you start to go to the physiological end range of hip flexion, which is about 120 degrees, if you want to go lower, which you can, the sacrum has to re-counter-nutate in order for you to achieve more depth. So you have this alteration of external rotation, internal rotation, and external rotation. If you want a really good resource on that, because, I mean, really the person who introduced this concept to me is, is Bill Hartman, Daddy O Pops. Check him out. I'll link him in the show notes. But you can also see this oscillation in a lot of the squat research. And you can see how it changes uh, depending on what type of squat stance you use. For example, there's an article that compared traditional squatting to powerlifting squat, so a wider stance. And because you can't go as low with a wider stance, you see once that person hits end range in their squat, the femurs really start driving into internal rotation, even though the hips are much more abducted. So there is this altering ER, IR, ER when you go down into a squat. Therefore, you might see different compensations in a squat depending on where that person's limited. So Will was talking about someone who's limited in IR. Maybe a scours is an issue or they have a loss of internal rotation. 
they might not be able to break parallel in a squat. Or they could break parallel, but they might have to shove their knees way out to do so. And the way, the why, why do they do that? Well, when they abduct, they can take up more internal rotation-based motion, which will allow them to hinge back further, thus allowing them to complete the full squat. And I say that in scare quotes because it's not what I would consider a true squat. And a lot of times with those people, you'll see the knees go way out and the spine will be much flatter. So if you're seeing that, you need to do things to improve rotation at the areas that you see restricted. And that could be working on squat depth. That could be choosing activities that bias relative external rotation or internal rotation. That could be hip shifting. Anything that that person needs. Assuming, of course, you know that they have the capability of stacking. If they don't have that, then we, we got nothing to talk about. You got to teach that first and foremost. So to summarize your great question, Will, yes, you do have internal rotation at the midpoint of a squat. You need to do things to improve IR in order to make that happen. But really throughout the squat, even though the bias is more counter nutation at the pelvis or inhalation, you have ER at the beginning, IR at the middle, ER at the end. Choose accordingly of what you have to target based on where your squat is limited. The last question comes from John. And here's what John asks. I was trying to tie the exercises you picked to mechanics and how a hip shift would bias inhalation and exhalation. Could definitely be covered in a debrief if you already haven't. Good question. What is a hip shift? A hip shift is where you're pushing one part of the pelvis back in relation to the opposite side. And when I think of a hip shift, what I re really think of is rotating the sacrum towards one direction or, or not. So if I'm going to shift my hips to the left, the sacrum is going to rotate to the left. If I, sh if I rotate the sacrum to the left, you're going to have left counter nutation and some right nutation happening to make that occur. Vice versa if I go to the right. And now you can have varying degrees depending on also what we talked about before with the squat. What degree of hip flexion do I have in when I'm doing this shift? For example, if I do a hip shift at 0 to 60, that's going to be more ER biased towards the extremity. And subsequently, that's going to drive greater countermutation at that range. So... Like uh, I've been, and it's weird how uh, you know John brought this up because I've been I have been doing a bit more shifting in clinic, but when you do higher depth shifts, I will do that to try to restore hip external rotation or if someone's got a loss of hip flexion, one of those two things will be the route that I go. Now let's say you have someone who's got a loss of IR. Split squat, we'll say, because if I'm split squatting and I shift here, because I'm at 90 degrees of hip flexion, at the bottom we'll say, when I shift, I'm gonna be driving further internal rotation because me rotating the sacrum to the left is gonna drive more IR at the femur. So this is gonna actually increase some degree of nutation on the left-hand side in internal rotation. So you can see how the same action has different consequences at the pelvis based on when and where and how I do it. So you could totally justify doing either shift depending on what you're going after. If you got someone who's got a loss of IR, hip shifting exercises or doing a split squat with a shift could be a great move. You got someone who's got a loss of ER, you could do a higher depth offset squat to elicit the change. Or you could do an offset squat all the way down. Either way, you're still driving external rotation or relative internal rotation depending on the amount of range you're, you're working in and what movement you're going for. That's the big thing when you talk about hip shifting. To summarize your great question, a hip shift involves rotation through the pelvis one direction or the other. You do have some changes at the anominate obviously, but I like to think sacral rotation. The ER or IR that's driven is going to depend on the amount of hip flexion that you are doing the shift in. High or low degrees of hip flexion, you're gonna get more ER. Mid-range, 
you're going to get more IR. And the hip shift can be a great way to enhance the effect because you're pushing towards a more end range that a simple tuck wouldn't get you. That being said, if you're going to work on shifting, make sure you have the stack in place because if you try to shift and they can't maintain the stack position, they're going to lose pelvic position and not get the adaptations that you desire. Great question, Mr. John. I think that's going to be a good stopping point for us today. I want to thank all of you beautiful, sexy people for tuning in to this Movement Debrief number 128. Gosh, we've done a bunch of these, which has been cool. I appreciate all of your support, and uh, thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. If you want to learn more, I would go to ZachCouples.com. While you're there, please subscribe to my newsletter. You'll get so many good things. You're going to get access to the Common Compensations Workbook, which is a great way to simplify your coaching. If someone's got limitations and you're unsure why they have those limitations, that workbook will help you guide through it. It's also got some really good tips to help improve your coaching skills. So that would be one thing I would look into. You got about five hours of lectures on breathing and pain, a free acute chronic workload calculator, lots of good stuff. Go ahead, check it out. I also offer lots of services on ZachCouples.com. The first that I have to mention is Human Matrix, my seminar. If you want hands-on coaching, um, definitely check out that seminar. I do have some dates available. It's all going to depend on how things are going with COVID. I know, um, you know, some places are doing great. Some, like Nevada, I mean, we're, we're struggling. It's, uh, it's a tough time for all of us. So I'm thinking of you in this time. And uh, check uh, the link in the show notes to see what dates are where. Um, but I hope to see you at one of them. I hope that things continue to get better so we can start having those things. So there's that. Other services that I offer, I offer movement consultations. If you're toy, you're not moving as well as you'd like to, or maybe you're struggling with your squat or your hip mobility, and you're like, eh, you know, I don't feel comfortable with the shift, and I want to know how to do it, a movement consultation can help you with that. What I will do is I will run you through a full body assessment, find the areas where you're restricted, and give you moves specifically targeted to you so your movement skills improve to the nth degree. I can teach you how to do that with your clients through the online mentorship program. That involves us working through some didactic stuff. And also, I like um, doing case studies and helping you with your coaching on some of these things because I find that that's often one of the biggest deficits people have implementing this material. I can help you sift through that. I also offer online training, but unfortunately right now I'm completely booked out. But if you want to get on the wait list, go ahead on my website and sign up. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, check me out on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Because guess what, folks? There's 128 other debriefs, and, uh, you know, you might not want to look at me for all of them. I get it. We didn't have cool pictures in the background and all of them, so maybe you want to just go ahead and listen to them. That's where Apple Podcasts and Stitcher come into play. Leave a review there so the fam can keep growing. Other places you can find me, I'm on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter, search Z Couples. Of course, I'm on the Instagram, baby, Zach, Z-A-C, couple C-U-P-P-L-E-S. And last but not least, search me on YouTube. Search Zach Couples, you'll find me. I'll be there for you, if you especially if you want to see some of the exercises that I apply with my supreme clientele. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been a beautiful, sexy, outstanding audience. I hope that you keep it real but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.